Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining this session where we're going to talk about forks and facts versus fantasy and fiction, food, fiber, flatulence, and feces. In other words, what the Fs? <laughs> We're going to talk about a lot of the F words. Um, and my name is Cindy, and I go by Asner Cindy online, both on YouTube and Facebook. And it's a great honor to be with you today. So we're basically, if you haven't figured it out, we're going to talk about digestion. So here's my disclaimer. We are going to talk about food, fiber, flatulence, and feces. Poop happens. Potty, can, potty talk cannot be eliminated from this discussion. It's going to happen. I'm a nurse. I have an odd sense of humor and my sincere and everlasting thanks to the folks at Keto Chow and their families for all they do and all they've done for us. So let's get started. My medical disclaimer, I am not a doctor. I'm not here to give you any medical device. Device, I'm not gonna give you a medical device, that's for sure. <laughs> advice, I'm not gonna, I work for a medical device company. I still work full time, but I'm not a doctor. So what I'm going to talk to you about are the basics of human um, digestion, and we'll go through those. And anything that you have a question for, if we have time, we'll work on that during the chat. Otherwise, please see your physician. So what's up, doc? So this entire talk is in memoriam to my mom and my sister. Debbie Stokes was my sister. A lot of you know her or knew her and my mom. And my sister, Debbie, my mom was great. My sister, Debbie has always looked up for me, always. I'm the younger one, she's the older one. My journey is all her fault. This was us probably at our heaviest. I came in at about 307 pounds. And this was us at a, at a conference before she got so ill. And it's all her fault because she sent me this video. <laughs> I'm not gonna cry, <laughs> I'm done, of Dr. Sarah Hallberg. We're on TED Talks where she talks about what if we're treating diabetes all wrong? Because I had been obese from my earliest memory, earliest memory, didn't have a normal childhood, didn't have a normal teenage years due to being so heavy back in the 60s and 70s when obesity was quite uncommon. And so at my heaviest, I was 307 pounds and I started the keto journey at 240 pounds. So this is what I look like. Um, and why am I showing you all this? So you know I've lived it. I've lived it. I know the struggle. I did as a nurse, even I thought I knew <laughs> eat less, move more, that type of stuff. And um, and it just wasn't working until I found keto. You know, I think this is pretty funny if you see the picture on your right, um, that even for a photo, I couldn't put down my candy bar. I was a carboholic. I truly, truly was. I was carb addicted. I didn't realize it. I thought I just had a lack of willpower. And if you've ever seen what people call the water balloon video, the whoosh video, this was me after about 25 pounds lost in my sister's front yard in Virginia. So Debbie and mom, this talks for you because I'm 94 pounds gone. You're not going to these days hear me talk about 94 pounds lost because I surely don't ever want to find them again. It's dramatically and absolutely revolutionized my life. It has set me free. I was never normal weight. I've got probably about another 10 pounds to go, but I want to encourage you, listen to what we're going to talk about, the power of what food does when our body recognizes it and then starts to digest it because food is basically an instruction manual. For your body and the, the different foods we put in impact us differently. So let's start talking about all those F's. And yes, you can pick up a chicken leg or a turkey leg if you want, but let's start talking about the different things. So my objectives really today to get a little bit more serious, and I, I really do have an odd sense of humor. I find myself amusing, so sorry about that. We're going to talk about, and I'll, I'll try to explain the digestive tract in very easy bite-sized pieces. I will throw in a lot of food and uh, potty humor here. I can't help it. Um, we'll just see how it comes out. Uh, um, so we're going to discuss the many words that are associated with digestion. That's food. Whether we're feasting or fasting, we're doing one or the other. When we eat, the body says, oh, a feast. And when we don't eat, it's a fast. So there's, a, I'm sure a lot of people 
we already know about intermittent fasting and the power of that. We're going to talk about flatulence, which is farting or gas that comes out through your anal sphincter. We're going to talk about fiber and we're going to talk about feces and how they interplay and what happens if you alter what you're eating, how often you're eating. And we'll talk a little bit about not as much as I'd like to because of time, but when feces misbehaves, when it doesn't behave, we can get leaky gut and we'll talk about that. We, we can become constipated, we can have diarrhea, et cetera. There's a whole host of problems with our digestive system that can actually make you miserable. So scattered throughout this, I'll have some food for thought slides. Um, let's talk first about when we eat. So when we eat, we are giving our body instructions. So as we're chewing and as it starts to go through our digestive system, that's feasting, meaning I'm giving my body nutrition, I'm giving my body energy, and this digested food, um, the components after it's been broken down, because the body can't use that turkey leg that you saw on the previous slide. So the, those digested components is sorted. It's broken into small pieces and it's useful for the body and it uses what it needs or it stores it for later. So the, the fat that we store in our body, think of it as a savings account, it's basically stored fuel. So we have, I, I had a lot of stored fuel. If each fat cell was a dollar, I would have been a billionaire. And what is not useful is eliminated into the potty and that's feces or poop or stool. But in the medical terminology, we call it feces. Now, that's what happens when we eat. What happens when we don't eat? So now we're also, by not eating, giving our body instructions as well. The fat storage has been waiting and waiting and waiting, or was waiting for me for 59 years, I'm 64 now, for me to stop eating long enough that the stored fat had a chance to be set free. Because it was it's stored energy. It's fuel that's just been hanging around for all those years. But I was eating on a, a continuous basis almost. I mean, it, there probably wasn't, unless I was asleep, an hour that I wasn't, and sometimes more often that I was eating something. So when we don't eat, we are also giving our body instructions. And this stored food, which is fat, it could be stored glucose, it could be glycogen in our liver, can be used by the, body's, uh, the, by the body, it processes it. And when we're not eating, it's fasting. And it's a wonderful thing. And everybody's got a different opinion about it. If you're new to keto, don't worry about it right yet. Just getting ketosis. And then a lot of things happen very nicely once you're in ketosis. So now let's talk a little bit about what we eat. We've talked about when we eat, when we don't eat, but what we eat. Well, when we, when our body looks at it and says, oh, she just gave me some scrambled eggs. Those scrambled eggs are literally packets of information and they're going to trigger specific enzymes to come out of various organs and parts of my body to help with the digestion. And enzymes are simply things because when I give it an egg, my body cannot use an egg. It needs the fat inside of it. It can use the proteins or the amino acids. Everything has to be broken down into its tiniest component before it can be utilized. And it also, the type of food that I eat, instructs different hormones to be released. And that is used to open up uh, the door, if you will, and allow things to come and go as needed throughout my body. So if we think back and we think about what I just said, and we think about, okay, when we eat or don't eat and what we eat, if that gives our body specific instructions and hormone signals, then we need to leave behind the fantasy, there's the F for fantasy, that a calorie is a calorie is a calorie. They're very, very different. A calorie is basically a unit of energy measured in, a, in an oven. It, it's not hard to really actually measure the, nutri the caloric um, value, but they're not the same. They're absolutely not the same because they each tell the body to do different things. And they deliver those sets of instructions based on where they come from. So when I talk about where they come from, I'm not talking about a farm or a factory. I'm talking about what are the components when the body finishes breaking things apart and deconstructing the food I've eaten. What are the things that it looks at? So if you've ever, been, if you've been on keto a while or low carb and people say, well, what are your macros? Macro is short for macronutrient. And that's basically your proteins, your carbohydrates and your fats. 
And then there's micronutrients. And, and so all your macronutrients have calories and they're not the same. Um, our body doesn't react to them the same. So my carbohydrates and my proteins each have, um, I just I just totally forgot, four calories per gram. And then I think fat has seven, maybe nine. Um, but know that they don't react the same in the body, but they have to be broken down to their smallest components. Micronutrients don't have any calories. That's your potassium, your sodium, your magnesium, all those things that are in the wonderful keto chow electrolyte drops. Um, and those don't have calories, but are actually very vital for all of our body functions to work at an optimal level. So I want you to think about all the stuff we've been going through with infections and, you know, pandemics and things. And I want you to realize that the first line of defense from the outside, all of the things that are trying to get into us as a host, they want to live inside the host and can harm us. There's a couple of main protective mechanisms. The first one is our skin, intact skin. You get a cut, you can get an infection. We touch more bacteria and viruses and things than you ever want to know. You just don't want to know. But it is important to wash your hands. But the other way that we are protected from outside contaminants and problems is through a very healthy digestion system or GI uh, tract. So let's go through that. What is the GI tract? I'm so glad you asked me. It stands for gastrointestinal. That's a, the medical term. So GI stands for gastrointestinal. And I want you to think of it. Remember, I said that the outside world is just full of bacteria and viruses, et cetera, just everywhere. We just can't see them. I want you to think of when I put something in my mouth, it's going to come out, my, it's going to come out through the anus, through the anal sphincter. But I want you to think of it as just a hollow insulated tube that allows the outside, we're actually physically choosing to allow the outside world into our very, very precious hemodynamic system that really needs to function optimally. And it lets that outside world pass through and be exited and hopefully glean or take what it needs from the inside. So as food enters, it comes in as that complex structure. It could be eggs. It could be that you made a, a keto sh chow shake. It could be that you made um, rice cauliflower and, and did some sort of casserole with that. What exits out when we go to the bathroom, when we defecate or have, you know, have a bowel movement or BM, that's just the body saying, that was stuff I didn't need. That was just junk. And that's the fiber that we can't absorb. And that's the feces. So those are the two Fs there. That's junk. That's what the body says. I don't need this. I'm not going to let it stay inside. And, and, you know, it's so interesting. We used to have of trash at the end of the week that we would put out once a week. And we had some recycling. Now that we've gone into mostly non-packaged foods, mostly whole foods, we have less trash. So as you switch over in the trash can outside, now I want you to take that analogy and I want you to think about it when you poop, right? So when you have um, a bowel movement, if, you are, if your body is able to use almost everything that you put in it because it's going to break it down and say, oh, I'll keep this, I'll keep this, I'll keep that, I'll keep that. Oh, I'll just get rid of this little bit that I don't need. You probably, your bowel habits will change. Um, that's okay. That's okay. We'll talk about. Uh, constipation and diarrhea later. So what's not needed is thrown away. So it's thrown in the garbage bin of your toilet. And it. I want you to think of it as a disassembly line. It's not an assembly line. It disassembles what you've put into it. And it, because it's a factory that disassembles, it has emissions, okay? And that's flatulent. And that's when you pass gas through your anal sphincter. And the noise it makes is where the round sphincter um, vibrates as the air passes out. If, if you're teenage son uh, belches um, or your spouse, um, that sound you hear is the vibration of one of the sphincters in um, our esophageal area. So I'll, I'll talk to you about that in a little bit. But really, it's so important. It really is so important. I hope this just intrigues you enough. It's surface level enough that you think, wow, I never knew how powerful my digestive health was to really assimilate or take in and use all these good food choices I'm making now on a low carb lifestyle. So we've got to keep good health, uh, gut health. I'll show you a little bit about what happens when things go wrong. 
So think of this as a shipping, handling, and delivery system. That's what your GI tract is. So let's take a look at a, a little photo. I'll stop just talking to the camera and show you some, um, and there will be a, a little bit of graphic stuff, but not a whole lot. So your GI tract, gastrointestinal tract, uh, take, your, take your tongue uh, and roll it around on the inside of your mouth. You're gonna feel that smooth, slick surface. That's mucosa, that's oral mucosa. And it's a specialized type of, uh, it's very resistant to friction. It, um, if you've ever had a canker sore, uh, you know, or you've um, gotten braces and you've had, you know, damage, you know that then food can get in that. But food normally, talking, chewing, the food, um, the mucosa protects it. Same thing, that mucosal lining, while it changes throughout the GI tract from the esophagus to the stomach and on down, it is built in to keep us are our bodies protected from all the digestion that has to happen, all the enzymes, all the acid production in the stomach. So it's resistant to those enzymes and acids. These are the major components. We're gonna talk about them, some a little bit more than others. We're gonna talk about the mouth, the pharynx, the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestines, the large intestines or colon, and the rectum and the anus. And these are all components that we need to understand because they'll make a difference in how you interact with your food and, and with life. So let's talk first about the importance of the oral cavity. This is where both mechanical and chemical digestion occurs. Please understand that we, I don't know this is on the next slide, but please chew your food. Please don't inhale it. Please don't be watching this video. Some of you are eating right now. I see you. Mm -hmm, I do. You're not focusing on the food right now. You're focusing on my great oratory skills. So mechanically, we chew. I digress. I'm allowed, I'm the speaker. Um, mechanically, we chew and we take that piece of food that we put in our mouth and we chew it up and we make it smaller. And we have that mechanical um, starting of the digestive process and our teeth tear it and grind it into smaller pieces. Chomp, 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 chomp. Now, adequate chewing. Chew your food. I, I did a video a while back called the 22 challenge to try to chew each bite of food 20 times. Why do I want you to do a good thorough chewing? Well, adequate chewing turns what you brought in into a pulp. And that pulp is important because the smaller you can get it in your mouth, the less hard, for lack of a better term, it's easier for the rest of digestion to occur. When you swallow big chunks of food and you, <gasps> we talk about inhaling your food, which you don't really ever want to do. You don't want to get it down and into your lungs. Um, we are eating it so fast that we're probably not chewing well and we are not giving enough time for our salivary glands um, to moisten the food for it to start the chemical digestion amylase is a um the enzyme that's in the mouth it's mildly acidic our saliva and by letting that saliva work around and moisten the food it's easier to swallow. So if you know of anyone that has, um, tends to choke on their food or they have a problem feeling like the food is stuck in their, in their esophagus, they're probably not um, chewing the food as well as they could. So let's talk about some more food for thought that salivation, not salvation, although that's important, salivation, it's our friend. You may not think that if, you're, if your kids think that's fun to, anyway. We won't even go there because you're thinking all these things about spit. But salivation actually can start just by thinking about food. It can start if you're walking. It, it, you, your mouth will salivate if you smell food. It'll salivate if you if you see a commercial. And that's that's the cephalic phase. That's the beginning of the cephalic phase where the brain goes, oh, incoming. There's food coming around. It is time for me to get ready and produce this saliva, this spit so that I can aid in the digestion. So saliva is important. Did you know that you can produce two to four liters of spit per day? That's a lot. Think of a two liter um, thing of iced tea or whatever. That's a lot, two to four liters a day. It's mildly acidic. It is rich in amylase. Amylase is the enzyme that helps us start to break down carbohydrates into sugar. Now you're like, well, I'm on a low carb diet. Unless you're an absolute carnivore, um, anything that you eat that has any component of fiber or carbohydrates in it, if you hold it in your mouth for a period of time and don't even have to chew, you will start to experience an increased sweetness. 
because the amylase will start to break that actually down into a sugar. So the enzymes ambush the mush in our mouth. We need to have time for the saliva to be there, especially for eating anything that's carbohydrate of any level. Don't care net versus total. But when we do swallow, now that chewed up food is called a bolus and it allows that bolus to easily slide down our esophagus. So I hope that makes sense. Let's talk about our food for thought, chewing your food. Chew your food. Am I guilty? Yes, sometimes. Am I guilty sometimes of listening to something or watching something while I eat? Yes. But if you ever sort of woken up and you're like, you know, you finish and you look down and there's not another bite and you're like, I don't even know if I really enjoyed that. So when we chew our food well, a couple of things happen. It's easier for the rest of digestion to occur. That food bolus does enter the stomach at a slower rate, and it allows the stretch signals that we have in our stomach to let us know when the stomach has reached capacity or when it's full. It does take about 20 minutes for us to really, the, the stomach's a little uh, lazy and it's like, I'll tell the brain in a minute that I'm ready. Okay, I'm really sort of, I might be able to fit a little bit more in. So by chewing slowly, you're aiding in digestion, you're helping it enter the stomach uh, in a slower manner. And really, when you savor your food, when you chew it 20 times and you're not reading something and you're just enjoying rolling that around and letting those taste buds um, access those wonderful flavors that we have when we eat a ketogenic lifestyle, it is related to satiety. You can eat the same thing and you're dining or you're eating and you'll have a different response. I have a different response. I am preaching to myself. Anytime you see that finger doing that, I am preaching to me. I never watch myself, but I might watch this one so I can be preached to. So slowly chewing your food and swallowing a nice moist bolus of food actually also reduces the amount of air that you swallow. So if you have a problem with belching, which is the medical terminology for that is eructation, um, you'll experience less of that if you do that. So that's it for the mouth. There's all sorts of stuff about the pharynx and the teeth and soft palate and hard palate, but we won't, we don't have time to go into that. So I just had a here. I'll, I'll back it up. Okay. This is a, a picture of our chest or our thoracic area and our abdominal area. And it's separated by an important muscle called the diaphragm, right? Now the esophagus starts at the back of the pharynx. The pharynx is the back of the throat and it is a smooth tube and it's a smooth muscle. And it's, think of it as a glorified laundry chute. If you've ever been in a house where they have a second floor or you've been in a hotel and they open up the door and they just throw the laundry down, it's just a passageway. It, nothing really happens there. You'll forget that you even have it um, unless something goes wrong. It does connect our oral cavity to our stomach. That's important. And that bolus of moistened by saliva uh, food bolus, when we swallow it, our swallowing is voluntary, but from that point on, everything else about digestion is involuntary. The body says, I got it from here. Stomach says, I got it. You guys just move on. I got it. So it truly is voluntary what we put in our mouth. It's voluntary how much in each bite, how many times we chew. Uh, but from that point on, once we swallow and it gets past the, the first third of the esophagus, the rest of that is involuntary all the way until we have a bowel movement that we have feces, we defecate. So the rest of that is um, involuntary. The peristalsis moves the food. What is peristalsis? I'm so glad you guys asked me that. Peristalsis is a wave-like motion of our all of the smooth muscle in our entire gastrointestinal tract from the bottom, you know, the top two thirds of the esophagus down, that's a wave-like motion that theoretically should only move one way, right? If you've ever vomited, if you've, <laughs> you know that it can reverse engines and it can come the other way, but most of the time peristalsis is this rhythmic contracture of the smooth muscle as the food moves through its digestion processes, deconstruction or disassembly line. So that esophagus, it's important to think about this. If you've ever aspirated anything or you've seen someone choke, it's really elegant. And I'll show you a little short video how when we swallow, the um, food is shunted into the esophagus and not into our trachea, which is our breathing tube at the back of our throat. So it empties into the stomach. That white line there is the diaphragm. That's the muscle. 
The diaphragm is the muscle that separates the thoracic cavity, our lungs and our heart from our abdominal cavity. And it's important that as that goes through, as the esophagus goes through the diaphragm, there's a little round, any circular muscle, a little round circular muscle in our body is called a sphincter, all right? And that sphincter is going to open and close at the right time. And it's going to keep the contents of what we've eaten down in the, in the um, abdomen. Let's watch this video. That's the bolus of food, well chew food. Now let's watch it again. The glottis closes and it shifts it instead of going into the trachea, which is in the front, it shifts it to the back of our throat and it allows that to go down. So this part right here, that's voluntary when I swallow. The rest of it is involuntary from that point on. So I hope that makes sense. So let's talk about the esophageal function. I should have smooth passage of that food bolus from the point of swallowing until it enters the stomach. That glottis, that little flap that you saw closing on the video, closes to shift the food into the esophagus versus the trachea. And this esophageal sphincter at the bottom that separates the esophagus from the stomach is that little round muscle. It will open and close when it senses the food coming down and the peristalsis moving. It opens up, shuts right away. Opens up, shuts right away. So it's nice when we eat more slowly. And really the only time we even think about our esophagus is when we have a problem with it, like maybe a pill, um, and it goes only halfway down because we didn't take a big enough drink. Or maybe we have a problem with reflux, um, that gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD. That's about the only time that we really think about of our esophagus. And that's that's good. That's, that's not a problem. All right. So we've talked about the mouth and the esophagus. Do you have the stomach for the rest of the talk? Ha ha. Because uh -huh. guess what our next organ of digestion is? It's the stomach. It's there. Um, the purple part that sort of looks like a, a little wine skin that the shepherd, uh, sheep herders used to carry around. So let's talk about the stomach. The stomach is a pretty cool thing. It has three layers of muscle and they go in different directions. It has a muscle on the outside um, that is longitudinal. It's got horizontal and then it's got an oblique layer. Now that's important because our peristalsis is pretty much just smooth muscle going down. But when we talk about what happens inside the stomach, I, it is an amazing process that it takes that food bolus and it starts to churn it. And it's, it's like crunching it. If you've ever kneaded bread dough, if you've ever done that and you've like squished it and you've done that or you've needed to break something up, um, some type of food, think of your hands next time and all the different movements you make as your stomach. So those three layers of muscles that are going in different directions are going to sort of mush the food up. It's really going to take that food bolus and it's going to start to really break it down even more. Now, this is a very important thing to understand that the bigger the food chunks are that you haven't adequately chewed up, the harder the stomach has to work. And you might get some indigestion and you might feel bloated because it's like, oh my gosh, would you stop swallowing? Give me a minute, please, will you? And so we need to give our stretch re receptors. Now, if I was inside the stomach, I would see that it has all of these really cool rugues and, and, and they're little folds up and down. So if I could spread the stomach out, think of it as an accordion, but it's all together, you know, like this when it's empty. It does have an amazing ability to stretch. And if you look at, um, let's see, I think Chris told me that my mouse will show good. Here's that esophageal sphincter, that round muscle. So the food bolus comes down, opens and shuts. And this stays shut until it, the body says, okay, I have mushed this up enough that I've turned it into chime. And then this pyloric sphincter that opens up into the small intestines allows a certain amount through, and then it shuts. Have you ever been somewhere where, the, well, of course, with all the stuff going on with the, the pandemic, we, you can only have so many people in and then you have to wait. And then when someone else leaves, somebody else can go in. Well, that's what that's what this pyloric sphincter does. So also the, the diaphragm is here. Now, why am I showing you the diaphragm again? First off, bonus, bonus statement, if you've ever had the hiccups, that's when you're having spasms in your diaphragm. That's what that is. Hiccups or spasms in that muscle. So that muscle separates our lungs and our heart from our abdominal cavity and all the contents that are down in there. And it's important, and we'll talk about what happens if that um, 
that opening loosens or my sphincter doesn't close and stay closed like it should at the end of the esophagus. I want to zoom in a little bit about those folds that we talked about just for a minute in the stomach. This is intricate. This is most amazing. Our bodies are pretty incredible. They really are fascinating. And all of these little uh, things that can flatten out and spread out when we eat a large meal and they get stretched have a lot of vessels in there. It's, we have a lot of hydrochloric acid that is produced here or stomach acid um, you'll hear about. But once it enters the stomach, that esophageal sphincter closes and the stomach can stretch to hold between two to four liters of food at a time. So next time you're at a grocery store and you see a two liter um, bottle of some sort of drink, I want you to think that my body, my stomach, in theory, could hold two of those. Should we eat that much? Probably not so much, but that's how much it can hold. It has those stretch receptors we talked about, but we have to give them time to let the brain know. And we have to put our fork down. When I say we have to, I really should just start saying Cindy needs to. Cindy needs to do better with this. But inside the stomach, we have this thick layer of these mucosal cells. And they're kept coated with mucus to keep the stomach from being damaged by the stomach acids. Think of it as a decontamination tank. If you've ever seen those movies where they have to get decontaminated because of all the junk, we are eating food that has touched all the bacteria around our world. And that's why all the things about refrigeration and all this are important. But our stomach is that first chance for the body to find, locate, and destroy bacteria and viruses. And it does that partly because it has an extremely acidic environment due to the production of the hydrochloric acid. This gastric acid, if you will, is extremely acidic. Bacteria do not thrive in an acidic environment. They thrive in an alkaline environment. So the bacteria have a chance to die, die bacteria. And it also starts to physically break down the food if you've ever dropped battery acid on something, you'll know it'll leak through things. But what's interesting is that it actually has a, it's, it's a lower pH, the lower the pH, the higher the acidity than battery acid. Very, very interesting. I want you to think on that. That's food for thought, isn't it? So these gastric acids and some other enzymes that start to be secreted in the stomach, break that bolus down into these small particles that are called chyme. It rhymes with chyme and rhyme. Parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. Must be thyme. Thyme. Anyway, not thyme, but thyme. Time to move on. Let's talk about thyme. Thyme is where our stomach is yearning and it's turning to digest. So if you've ever heard someone's stomach growling before a meal or making all these really embarrassing noises after you've eaten, that's your stomach going, oh, yeah, I'm going to make this. <laughs> it's, so much, it's so amazing. To your food. It doesn't have to work so hard. The stomach doesn't have to work so hard if we're all chewing our food. So this is um, up here where you see the two arrows is the esophageal sphincter. That opens and shuts. This is our pyloric sphincter down here. This stays shut. And when a food bolus comes down, open and shut again. If you continue to rapidly, if we continue to rapidly put food into this stretchable um, area, and then we lay down and we, we go to bed or we maybe bend over, we can have problems. And one of the things that a lot of us um, have been hearing a lot about, and maybe you have experienced it yourself, is what they call GERD, which is gastroesophageal reflux disease. Do not have time to go into a lot of it. But I wanted to let you know what's just an idea of what's happening. It, it can be quite complex. It can actually erode your esophagus. You can get all sorts of Barrett's esophagus and other things too. But I want you to, to look here, if you will, please, that this sphincter will open when it shouldn't. It's like it's supposed to be a one-way door and it's supposed to be triggered like one of those automatic doors that you can enter, but you can't get out. Um, and when you tri trip it, it opens and then it shuts right behind you. So in GERD, there's a, a series of reasons that they believe it's happening, but the sphincter will open. And remember this, this acid that our stomach produces is stronger um, in pH than battery acid. And it will slide back up into the mucosal area of the esophagus, which has a different type of mucosa. It is not meant to be exposed to all that um, very strong acidic environment. And it starts to actually auto-digest your esophagus. 
So that's what GERDs is in, in a nutshell. That's a really, really high level view. So if we think about how important the stomach acid is for food digestion and decontamination of bacteria and viruses that we are putting into our mouths, our acid blockers, your friends, that's certainly your call. But if you're blocking these proton pumps that um, produce this very, very important aid in digestion and protection from those outside, remember, our GI tract is a hollow passageway. It's a tunnel, if you will. And we're putting foreign things inside and we want them to enter, use what we need and exit and not contaminate our body itself. So are there alternate ways to manage GERD? Absolutely. Um, that's uh, for a discussion. There's all sorts of great videos out there on this. Uh, I know Dr. Ken Berry for one and some uh, quite a few others have some great things about treating it. Um, but just think through that because um, that without that acid, you're prone to, any of us are prone to problems. Another thing that we have with the stomach, um, you've probably heard this uh, from a friend or maybe a, your mother or someone you know, that remember the diaphragm. So over here, this that we saw earlier, we've got this diaphragm that's right here. That's that muscle. Well, I said earlier that this diaphragm sort of is a, a snug fit and I've got the sphincter here that opens and closes. Sometimes, especially if we have um, if we have obesity, like I did for years, we will have so much pressure in the abdominal area that the air in the lungs can't fight against it. And so the pressure of the solid food will slide part of the stomach up actually into the thoracic cavity. Now, there's no spillage of food into the thoracic cavity, but it takes up space. It hurts. It's not supposed to be there. The stomach is supposed to stay down in the abdominal cavity. And sometimes it slides up and down. So a big meal, drink too much liquid with it, anyone to eat too fast, and it can slide up. It causes a lot of people think they're having a heart attack when it's actually their hiatal hernia. And some in some patients, it's, it gets up there in its face. So that's a hiatal hernia. That's what it is. It's where part of the stomach has actually gotten up into the thoracic cavity. And there's ways that we can treat that as well. So we're going to move from the stomach now into the small intestines. I'm going to check my time. And what we want to talk about is value of understanding from this point on that this is where our nutrient absorption happens. This is so, so important. And please don't confuse small with short or unimportant. It's actually called the small intestines because it's about half the lumen or diameter of our large intestines. It's about 22 feet long. It has three different functional areas, the duodenum or duodenum. People say it different ways, tomato, tomato, duodenum, duodenum, the jejunum and the ileum. I have ileum spelled wrong. It's I-L-E-U-M. And almost all of our nutrient absorption happens here in the small intestines. Very, very, very important. And so this is not a small thing because every single cell in my body has got to be replenished. It's got to be replaced when it's lifespan is over. We have different lifespans with different cells and we need to have enough building blocks of those good macronutrients for that to occur. So in this picture, and I'll, I'll talk about each of these components separately, the duodenum is here or duodenum. It's the shortest part. And then the jejunum picks up and then we've got the ileum. So this sort of looks like a big bowl of homemade sausages. Um, yes, I'm a nurse and I use food analogies as much as possible. And then that connects to the large intestines, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Now, I've said several times already that this is where the major part of our nutrient absorption occurs. You saw the folds inside the stomach. We, inside these small intestines, it, it can stretch some, but it has these little fingers, these little projections, and they're called villi. And these little, these little fibers, if you will, they almost like little, little uh, urchin type of things. They sort of are waving around and the peristalsis is moving things by. And the purple that you see there is this thin layer of epithelium. It's like a skin cell and it is one cell thick. Skin cells are so thin. One cell thick, just one. And it allows the diffusion of that, the nutrients as, as it's been, as the proteins breaking down to amino acids, as the fats getting down to glycerol and the meat, um, amino, excuse me, fatty acids, um, the body, these little one, one layer cells go enter, 
intro. <laughs> they don't say that. Please don't listen. Although sometimes I think my husband's stomach is saying that. But anyway, so up inside those little fingers, those little projections that are doing these little sort of movements, you have an artery. Arteries take blood away from the heart and a vein. It switches over to a vein at the capillary level. And tucked up inside of that, there's a lacteal. The lacteal is what absorbs the fat. And your other micronutrients and macronutrients are pretty much absorbed into the actual circulatory system. So fat is absorbed into the lymph system, eventually ending back up in circulation. But it goes through that lymph, uh, that lacteal. And what's really interesting is how thin that layer is and how important that is. Because inside of, we've already talked about all the bacteria we, we bring in. But I don't want you to think that all bacteria in our gut are bad. They're not. Okay, we've heard about the horrors of E. coli with unwashed spinach or undercooked hamburger meat. It can be deadly. So some of these bacteria can literally kill the host. But good bacteria help, help split the food into its nutrient components. Incoming food comes in. They sort of help scrub things and, and make sure that the, the vitamins are actually going to get in, all those micronutrients. And they're good at sort of cleansing it and, and keeping things moving along. So the good bacteria are good. We've heard about the good gut microbiome. And if you think about those little villi that we were talking about, those little fingers, those little projections, they are in certain cell groups, if you will. And these cells are holding hands. If you've ever held hands like this, you're not going to hold hands well. They are holding hands like this. I mean, they've got a grip. And these tight junctions, because it's only one cell thick, Right underneath that, that little part of the drawing down here that you see, that's your, that's your circulatory system. That's a capillary. That's a capillary. That's your blood. That's your blood. That is your blood. Okay. So pre-keto pre taco here, <laughs> down here, blood. All right. We do not want components that should be exiting out when we, ha when we have a bowel movement to travel instead into our circulatory system. So the health of our small intestines, the, the quality of the food that we ingest, um, fewer preservatives, fewer dyes, um, the best quality food you can afford is good. You don't have to always buy, as, as Dr. Kinberry says, the panda massage beef. Um, but this, all these little villi, the duodenum or duodenum, is that first section? It's the it's the first section, and as the as the chime leaves the stomach, it it gets there, and this is where the liver puts the bile in. The liver goes, oh look, there's some fat. I got I got this thing called bile, and bile helps digest the fat. It breaks it up from. If you've ever used Dawn dishwashing liquid, and you have the greasy liquid on your sink, and you and you drop it in, it just it breaks it up into tiny little uh, globules. That's what bile does. I've had a gallbladder taken, my gallbladder taken out. At, it's called a cholecystectomy way before keto, probably 30 years ago. And the bile is made in the liver, stored in the gallbladder. We'll talk about that in just a minute. I get ahead of myself. Um, I want you to think of the duodenum or the duodenum as that mixing bowl. So this very acidic gastric chime comes out and it now starts to neutralize it a little bit because all of the bacteria kill or most of it has happened there. And it starts now become a little bit less acidic. And the major work of digestion occurs here. I mean, the completion of the breaking down, because also coming into the duodenum are the, is, um, are the digestive enzymes that come from the pancreas. Okay. So the pancreas is, is got a little duct going into your duodenum or duodenum. The gallbladder squirts it out. It, it contracts and it squirts it out. If you don't have a gallbladder, it's still being made. The bile's still being made. It just sort of drips. And what's interesting is that a lot of us that have had a cholecystectomy years ago, this is just a reservoir. Think of it as your gas tank. Um, we'll, we will create a pseudo gallbladder. We'll, we'll create like a little basin here. The body's like, I got to have something in reserve. So if you're very, very sensitive to fat, then you've had your gallbladder out. You might need to take some sort of digestive enzymes. And there's lots of people that talk about those. But the pancreas and the pancreatic enzymes, um, the digestive enzymes come in here as well as the bile. Now, second part of the small intestines is the jejunum. The bulk of actual absorption happens here. So we have the rest of digestion and the duodenum. 
and we have the absorption, most of that occurring here in the jejunum and the small intestines. And this chyme is now uh, being further broken down into the fatty acids and glycerols, the amino acids, the glucose, fructose, and fiber. We're gonna talk about fiber just a little bit because I'm conflicted about the fiber. Um, but that's your jejunum. It's longer than the duodenum. But the longest part of our small intestines is the ileum. And these digested particles are like happy and, and the body is taking up what it can and it's absorbing what it can and what it needs. And it's just sort of flowing. It's ultimate next, next stop, large intestines. Next stop, large intestines. So when it exits the ileum, it's going to go into the large intestines. And here we do see water starting to be absorbed. Um, at a much higher rate than in the previous parts of our um, digestive system. And B12 is um, absorbed here. If you've had an ileal jejunal bypass, or if you've had some uh, Roux & Why, not so much the gastric stapling or the gastric sleeve, um, you will probably have some level of malabsorption syndrome, meaning if they have disengaged that part of our important part of our um, nutrient absorption, from your body's ability to grab those nutrients, please work closely with your doctor and long-term forever be aware that you may have to take sublingual B B12 under your tongue. You may need to be monitored for iron. Um, there's a lot of things that you need to be aware of if you have had that type of surgery. Great surgery for certain people that need a, an immediate intervention, but there's other ways with, uh, listen to Dr. Robert Seibus and he'll, you, you'll hear how he feels. A bariatric surgeon is what he does, but he'll only do the sleeve gastrectomy. Um, accessory glandular digestive organs. Well, that's a mouthful, Cindy. What in the world is that? That's your liver, your gallbladder, and your pancreas. We already talked about it a little bit, but I want you to see how tucked in everything is. So the liver is the heaviest organ in our body, even if it's not a fatty liver and it has so many functions. It does so many things. It's the stomach sort of nestles up underneath that. And then tucked in at the curve of the duodenum is our pancreas. And it's really tightly packed there. So if you've ever gotten to the point where you've eaten so much, you are like, I cannot breathe. Um, you stand up, what do we do? We stand up because now we're increasing the amount of, of area. And because um, all that food is pressing up on our poor little diaphragm and the lungs are like just air and they're like, oh, okay, oh, okay. And so we stretch it out to give more space. But everything here is really tightly compact. But the liver is so vital for all of the things we were talking about, not just for digestion, but it's vital for digestion. But look at this. Look at this list. This is like, you know, if I was introducing the liver to you, this would be the introduction that just kept going and going. Synthesizes and secretes bile, stores glycogen in our lipid res uh, reserves. It maintains blood glucose, amino acids, and fatty acid concentrations. Whoop. What do you mean? Well, glycogen is stored here. So listen to Dr. Ben Dickman or some of the others talk about um, the, the glycogen insulin paradigm and, and how they're sort of a seahaw, uh, uh, what do you call it? seesaw? <laughs> so I was going to say sawhorse. Um, it synthesizes and releases cholesterol and helps bind them to those transport proteins, LDL, HDL. What? Liver produces, yes. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, only a small part of what you eat of cholesterol is important. You, your liver, if you're on a low cholesterol diet, your liver is going to go, heck, I got to pump out some more cholesterol because our fat soluble vitamins need it, our hormones need it to be produced. It's, it's in every cell wall. Cholesterol is vital for life. So many people have talked about it much more eloquently than I ever will. So I'll stop there about cholesterol. But look at what else it does. It synthesizes our clotting factors and plasma proteins. It detoxifies. When we, it is like a huge detoxification tank, whether we're drinking alcohol or whether we're ingesting something, a toxic uh, product or chemical, the liver takes on the heavy burden. And that's why if you choose to drink alcohol on a ketogenic diet and the liver sees it, it won't the liver won't say, oh, but it's only so many carbs. It's going to say, uh-oh, toxic substance. Alcohol, sad to say to you, sad to say to me, is toxic. That's why you can people can die of alcohol toxicity. We've all heard the, this really sad stories of college students. 
storage of iron reserves, actual storage of blood. It actually is a huge reservoir for our venous blood and it actually stores our fat soluble vitamins and it's responsible for absorption and breakdown of circulating hormones, but not production of, but absorption and breakdown of insulin and epinephrine. Very interesting. So we've got this normal liver here on the left, lots of stuff out there about fatty liver. Trust me, none of us want fatty liver, but it is rampant. It is rampant. My liver used, I used to have uh, fatty liver, the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We used to, when I was in nursing school 40 some years ago, we used to only see cirrhosis or fatty liver in an alcoholic because of that toxicity of alcohol. But we are seeing it with this huge consumption of fruit juices and all of the constant snacking and all this stuff that's going on. So if you look back, let's go back just a minute. This is only a few of the functions of the liver. I mean, I could have gone on and on and on. You want your liver working well. I want my liver working well. I don't want a liver that is so burdened with storing that excess fat or because glucose can be managed through um, insulin and, and goes into the cells, fructose can only be managed by the liver. So please, if you do one thing for your kids, stop the fruit juices, please, 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 please. All right, so we've talked about this a little bit. I'm running a little bit short on time, but the pancreas does a ton of things. I didn't even put them all in because I, I looked at how many slides I had. And I was like, oh, Cindy, you've gotten a little too detailed at the beginning. But I do wanna get to how complex not only our digestive system is, but how complex and how it interacts with our circulatory system and the liver and, and the duodenum and our muscles and where glycogen is stored and what happens with these free fatty acids and can I eat all the fat I want all day long? Disclaimer, no. <laughs> it's not an all-you-can-eat buffet. Every calorie we take in, meaning unit of energy, the body has to burn or store. It's just harder for it to store the fat and there's the tidy, but if you have a chance, listen to um, Dr. Ted Naiman or Maria Emmerich about increasing our protein and dropping our fat. So those villi that we talked about that are tightly, tightly bound, they're holding hands really, really tight. Um, this is important to think through all of the blood that's flowing through all these little fingers and the, the lacteals where the, you know, the fat is absorbed. What's really interesting is that if we think about this one cell thick layer and we think about it and we think that our, our circulatory system, these capillaries, which is where all diffusion, um, blood brings in the groceries and it takes out the trash and it all that happens at the capillary level. And that's what's going up through these little fingers. And so these normal tight junctions, I'm gonna talk about leaky gut for a minute. Some believe in it, some don't, but I want you to think through, it's not all based on food but toxins, environment, the pollutions, the type of food we eat. You can have a gluten intolerance, not full-blown celiac. But what's interesting about this is that if that one cell, if those junctions start loosening, all right, and those food particles are in their smallest form already, and maybe there's some, well, there's always going to be bacteria in our gut, good bacteria, bad bacteria, but, and they see an opening, have you ever seen a kid see the door open just for a minute? They're like out the door like a flash. So that's what happens when we start to have these junctions not be so tightly together. We can have all sorts of outside contaminants. Remember, our GI system is a hollow tunnel that doesn't let bad stuff get into our actual body. It, it absorbs things that we need. But with these tight junctions broken apart, we end up with all sorts of problems and it can, a lot of people think it can trigger autoimmune. I will tell you that about 30 years ago, I found out I have an onion intolerance. I'm not allergic, like I'm gonna go into an anaphylactic state, but I have an onion intolerance. And when I eat onions, I am miserable, bloating, gas, diarrhea. My body, for whatever reason, will not deal with it. And when I figured out through working with a dietitian and an um, allergist that I had to stop all onions, all onion powders, why don't you start looking at the back of packages, please? If you have bloating, IBS, um, any one of a number of digestive issues, please think through maybe going on an elimination diet and try to reduce um, what you're exposing yourself to and then start adding things in. But you got to give time 
for these cells to heal. It won't happen overnight. And this is just one artist's rendition of all the things that when these um, areas that are in, these things that are inside the gut now get into my circulatory system. Oh my word, can you imagine? So we want to try to think through giving our gut a rest, not eating you know, nonstop from the moment we get up because it engages us in a chronic inflammation if we do have leaky gut, that's very similar to what happens with inflammation when we eat too much sugar. Everything from metabolic disorders to a lot, you know, depending on what you're reading about autoimmune and even cancer and bone and joint things, because these things that were never meant to float around inside our bloodstream are floating around and it puts the body on high alert and it goes into this major protective state, autoimmune. It's trying to, um, ramp up its defense, but it gets confused, it gets exhausted, and it starts turning on ourselves. So the large intestines, we're almost done here, we're almost at the end, haha, <laughs> we're almost at the end. So the large intestines are actually fairly easy to talk about because their function within our digestive system is pretty minimal. What our colon does, or our large intestine, is it helps absor absorb water, and it helps absorb the finishing uh, res uh, of salt, some minerals. It's basically on the downhill slide. It pass. It allows the passage of anything that's junk, anything, any type of waste products that we've consumed down and out and into the toilet. And this species, as it travels, and I'll show you the pathway it takes, becomes increasingly solid during this transition. It only produces the mucin to help lubricate things. And defecation is the term we've talked about where the feces exits our body. So after a nice good bowel movement, we typically feel better. And I'm glad to tell you, you're no longer full of crap, at least till the, <laughs> till the next time. All right, so let's look at the down and out of the colon. It actually starts on the left-hand bottom and that's the ascending colon. So it comes out of the um, ileum and it goes through the cecum, which is the beginning of the large intestines or colon, people or bowels, people will call it different things. And it makes a, a turn up by the liver, it's called the hepatic flexure, traverses across the belly, and that's the transverse colon, makes another turn at the spleen and comes on down, that's the descending colon. And then by this point, it's getting to the point, there's these stretch receptors in our sigmoid colon, but especially in our rectum that when it expands, you feel the need to go to the bathroom, please do so. Now, what type of stool are there? <laughs> so if you've ever heard Zoe Harcrum talk, I first heard about the Bristol stool chart from her. Um, I think it was low carb Denver a couple of years ago. So from England, courtesy to you, and you can find this online all the time, is the Bristol stool chart. And they've given it a name, type. <laughs> So type one are the separate hard lumps, the little rabbit pellets. Type two is lumpy and sausage-like. I'm sorry, I didn't make these up. I'm sorry, if you're eating, stop eating because you're not supposed to be eating while I'm talking because we want you to enjoy your food. Um, you can read through, I won't I won't make you read all of this, just Google Bristol stool chart. Um, and diarrhea is mushy consistency with the ragged edges, but severe diarrhea is that liquid consistency, no solid pieces. Diarrhea is awful. Constipation is awful too. Diarrhea is oftentimes, um, it could be something you ate. It could be um, some sort of food poisoning. And what that means is there's so many bacteria. The body is doing a rapid eject. It, it's gone. It's, it put the pedal to the metal to get it out of your body before it makes you extremely ill. Um, same thing with vomiting. Oftentimes you'll feel better once you vomit or once the bad food that you ate exits. There's other reasons for diarrhea. but um, a lot of it's related to that good bacteria, bad bacteria. They're not all bad. Um, so there's going to be a different type of bacteria in the colon in, in some ways than the small intestines. And I didn't have time to, to discuss SIBO, which is small intestines, bac small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Didn't have time for that. But when we think about what happens in the colon, that absorption, um, we've got fiber, fermentation, flatulence, and feces going on here. So that fiber question, should I eat fiber? Should I not? How important is it? I'll let you work that out for your, <laughs> work that out for yourself. But you have two types of fiber. You have soluble and insoluble. The soluble, the body can break down. That's why you have to be careful about net carbs, because if it's soluble fibers, the body can break it down and you end up with a carbohydrate insoluble is something like the oat fiber, not oat brand, but oat fiber that the body is like, what in the world did you put this 
in my body for because I cannot use it and it is going to pass on out and it's not going to be used at all. It's just like it's there for the ride. So the soluble can be broken down, carbs released, the insoluble, no benefit whatsoever for nutrition and it's got to be removed. Now there's an intricate fermentation process using the gut bacteria when there are carbohydrates. If any of you have ever known anyone that makes kombucha or makes their own sauerkraut, those good bacteria in the presence of carbohydrates will create bubbles. Bubbles, tiny bubbles. If, you, <laughs> if you're eating a lot of fiber and you're farting a lot, then that is most flatulence. That is most likely due to all that fermentation of all that fiber you're eating. And if it's embarrassing or limiting you or your wife is getting ready to you make you sleep in another bedroom, it could be a food intolerance like I had with onions. It could be that you don't need the fiber you think you need because that just came about about 20 or 30 years ago. It's not ever been historical and it impacts your feces. Um, anything that ferments pretty much produces gas bubbles. It's got to come out. Um, and those it can be malodorous because you're dealing with waste products that the body just wants to get out. They can be mal malodorous. We've all heard the silent but deadly. I love this. Many of my carnivore friends, and I'm I'm an inadvertent carnivore many days, um, they report they're not full of hot air anymore. They just don't fart. Why do they not fart? Why do they not have flatulence like they used to? They took out the fiber. The fiber is of no benefit to our body for nutrition for nutrition. And I like to think of it um, when I eat a lot of fiber and it swells up, think of a beaver dam. Instead of letting the water flow, it blocks it up. So maybe, maybe fiber is good for you and maybe it's not. And that's for you to decide. So let's talk about the rectum and the anus rectum. It almost killed him. Ha, a little joke there, a little nursing humor. But the rectum and the anus are where we are going to hold the stool that we're going to defecate into the toilet. And when this, um, the anus is a sphincter, the anal sphincter is another round muscle. And if you have hemorrhoids, that's where a, you've strained so hard that you've sort of popped a blood vessel out and it's become, uh, you have a varicosity. Um, and the rectum is what's going to hold the bowel, of the, not the bowel, it's going to hold the feces. So if you suffer with constipation or you think you do, the medical definition is it's less than three bowel movements per week, less than three, which means two. OK, so that's one every third and then a fourth. And, you know, maybe you go three times one week, but increased dehydration of the feces occurs. It just sort of remember the colon is taking out the water and it's characterized when you do go by straining, pain, difficulty. Um, you can have little tears. You can see a little bit, bit of bleeding sometimes on your stool from the straining. It's just so hard. And so the rectum and parts of the colon can be filled with that. Dehydration continues. The longer it's in there, the, the, they're just going to. The colon doesn't know. It's like I'm doing my job. Just do. You guys need to move on. But if you're still here, I'm just going to pull out my fluid. I'm going to pull out. It's what I'm doing. It's what I do. It's what I do. And this is sad. It impacts twice as many women as men. Hmm. That's just not fair. <laughs> and, oh, good. This is even better. It tends to grow more common with aging. <laughs> so, fiber. Is it necessary or is it problematic? It's going to vary. It's going to vary by you and only you are going to be able to tell by doing your own experiment, experimentation. But what can increase our risk factors? Smoking, some meds, especially pain meds, will slow down that peristalsis so it stays there longer. Being sedentary. One of the best things you can do, if, if and I can do, and I, I find myself, if I feel that maybe, oh gosh, when's the last time? I, because I don't track it. There are people that like track it. I'm like, ah, I don't know if I've gone to the bathroom. Um, drink some water, get up, and walk around. Dehydration could be a problem. Maybe fiber is good for you. Maybe for you, it's not. And here's the biggest thing I want you, please, don't ignore the, the urge to defecate. We've all felt that like we're like, oh, I could go to the bathroom. Oh, let me finish this show. No. <laughs> you can do what you want. You're in America or wherever you're listening to this. But that urge is when it's going to be the easiest. If you ignore it, unless it's really, really explosive diarrhea, the urge will pass and you've missed your opportunity to have a normal bowel movement because it's just going to continue to um, absorb because there's more incoming. 
coming, especially if you're not in a fasted state or you're still eating frequently throughout the day. As it enters on the bottom left into our ascending colon and keeps coming across, it's going to keep packing down and packing down and packing down, and we don't want that. So what are some non-drug options? Increase your movement. It's going to help your peristalsis help you. Help me. Help you. Help me. Help you. <laughs> don't become dehydrated. Drink, drink, drink. Increase your salt and mineral content. Oh my word, do you know what milk of magnesia is, mom's little friend? It's magnesia. It's if you are constipated and you don't want to do a stimulant type where it, it makes your bowel contract and it's really painful, warm salted water, good old salty water, um, a bunch of magnesium, just magnesium citrate is what is in those little green glass bottles they used to give you for a colonoscopy. If you've ever had to have a colonoscopy, you know how salty and, and gross it is. When all that salt hits your colon, all this fluid is pulled in from your body. It loosens that stool up and allows you to go. Don't ignore the urge to go, please. Please don't ignore the urge to go. And adjust your fiber intake. Maybe more, maybe less. That's up to you. Have no time to talk about all the problems with the colon, but there are a lot of them. Everything from diverticulosis, diverticulitis, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, irritable bowel syndrome with constipation, irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea. So many of you have let us know that your symptoms or severity of your flares has reduced as you've taken out certain preservatives or dyes or don't know. For me, it was onions and onion powder. I can't have leek, shallots, onions, onion powder. And people say, oh, Cindy, I, I couldn't live without onions. And I'm like, yes, you can. So when someone tells you they can't live without their bread or fill in the Oreos or whatever, yes, you can. When when the outcome is severe enough that that you realize I have to give that up, yes, you can. So everything in our body, in closing, everything in our body is impacted by what we eat when we eat, um, how often we eat, the amount we eat. Hopefully today's um, in and out journey um, has helped you about thinking through that from the mouth, this is a nice little schematic I got off of Pinterest, um, that when we chew it and we swallow it, I'm working down the left-hand side and it goes into our stomach and is blended and the liver picks, picks up the pace and the I'm going back up to five and the pancreas and small intestine, large intestine, are, that solid waste passes out the anus. All of those F's are amazing and will help you feel better than you have been and have a fulfilled life. So thanks until staying till the end. And that's the end of my talk about digestion. Thank you so much.